jump over to the uh, the actual thing here. So let's see if I can use Zoom without hurting myself. Okay. So I should be able to see like desktop and okay, can we see that? Does that come across? Awesome. Okay, so uh, again, thank you for having me. Um, just a, a quick little background on, on who I am and, and why I have any clue what I'm talking about, uh, moderate though it may be. I've been working in technology and security since the early to mid 90s. I've worked across a whole slew of different industries from military, government contracting, academia, technology.com companies, financial services companies, media. So I've seen a lot of the same problems and it doesn't really change much from org to org. What really changes is the mission. And that really is important here because this is everybody's problem from an organization all the way down to the individual. And hopefully tonight you'll, you'll get a little bit more of an idea of why that is, be able to do your own research, ask your own questions and get a better outcome than we would have otherwise. So without uh, further ado, let's take a look. So the first thing is quantum what? What are we talking about? Some have gone through some introductory physics or even advanced physics, you might know. Others have heard the term. Other people like me first got introduced to it through this television show. And yes, I am still bitter of what, 30 years later about how that show ended, but we will put that aside for now. What we really wanna talk about is quantum computing and quantum encryption. They are different things and we're going to address each of them differently but it's important to realize that when we say quantum encryption we're not just talking about encryption running on quantum computers we're talking about an entirely different approach to how we protect information um, i also should state a, a little bit of disclaimer here i have researched this formally in an academic setting uh, not as recently as I would have liked, it wasn't in the last 12 months, and I am not a physicist. So you may catch me in something that might be oversimplified, that's okay. If you catch me in something that's incorrect, that's okay too, feel free to point it out. The idea here is to share information, not for me to feel like I know it all. So let's just get out front that I definitely don't, we just wanna get everybody's collective knowledge up. So computing, cryptography. Encryption, computing, however you want to think about it. Hopefully by the end here, you will have some takeaways, I mean, maybe more than this, but the bare minimum, I hope you all be able to recognize the difference between traditional and quantum computing and traditional and quantum cryptography. Where we are now, sort of have a feel for that, even though it's hard to predict with precision and realize what this might mean for you, for your job, for your family, for your data, whatever it may be that you see it, it concerns. You've probably heard of Schrodinger's cat. You've probably heard something about it being dead or alive. What you may or may not be familiar with is what the actual experiment, or I should say thought experiment was about. It wasn't an actual experiment because uh, it's pretty gruesome when you think about it. This is a construct where you have a cat locked in a box with some type of toxic substance. There are a few different variations, toxic gas, uh, I think a bomb and uh, something else. And the idea is there's a basically a 50-50 chance that this whatever will kill the cat. But you can't actually know unless you opened the container and looked, right? Yep, might be alive, might be dead. And the thing is, it, it doesn't matter if the cat is alive or dead, because what we're building here is about uncertainty. And the fact that we accept there is uncertainty and build equations and, and approaches around that uncertainty. Uh, so there are many people who can explain this a little better than I can. And we're gonna go to one of them here and, and I'm gonna hope that I, the Zoom gods are happy with me and the sound comes through. So please like wave me down or something if I'm playing you a, a silent video here. This wouldn't be a YouTube channel without a cat video. So without further ado, we present Schrodinger's Cat. 
I'm sure you've heard some version of this famous thought experiment. You put a cat in a bunker with some unstable gunpowder that has a 50% chance of blowing up in the next minute, and a 50% chance of doing nothing. The gunpowder is Einstein's version, Schrodinger preferred poisonous gas. But whatever. So until we look in the bunker, we don't know whether the cat is dead or alive. And when we do look, it is either dead or alive. So if we repeat the experiment enough times with enough cats and bunkers and gunpowder, we'll see that half the time, Kitty survives, and half the time, Kitty goes bye-bye. The quantum mechanical interpretation is that before we look, the cat is in a superposition. It's both dead and alive. And our act of looking forces nature's decision. So our curiosity kills the cat. But what about the cat's perspective? Well, the cat either sees the gunpowder explode or not. So inside the bunker, we actually have these two possibilities. The powder explodes and the cat sees it explode, or the powder doesn't explode and the cat doesn't see it explode. There's no option, the powder explodes and the cat doesn't see it explode. So the cat's reality becomes entangled with the outcome of the experiment. And it's our observation of the experiment that forces nature to collapse to one option or the other. But we're like the cat too. Either the cat dies and we see it dead, or the cat lives and we see it alive. So who's observing us to force nature to collapse to one reality? Or do both possibilities happen in parallel within a larger multiverse? This collapsing to one reality problem is one of the biggest unanswered questions in quantum physics. So for Kitty's sake, can I has answer please? All right, so maybe that'll keep you up at night a little bit, thinking about who's watching us. Maybe it won't, but the, the uh, real idea here is this concept of entanglement and uncertainty and the math that they use to build around it. Fortunately for all of us, certainly for me, you don't have to understand the math. You do not need to be able to look at this and fully all the, understand all the things that are going on here. What is important is you recognize that the more precisely you measure one quantity, the less precisely you can know another associated one. What does that mean? Well, if we measure the position, the more precise we get in position, the less we know about the velocity. The more precisely you measure the velocity, the less precisely you can tell you the position. So there's always this trade-off between the two. Beating on the same drum, uh, maybe this will help illustrate it a different way, uh, if you're familiar with the with this comic strip. So we can say it changed this much, right? From yesterday to today, it changed by 20,308. Where did you start from? We don't know. So that's what they're talking about. You know one thing, you don't necessarily know the other. Again, you don't need to understand this to understand why it's important. This is just sort of a a foundation for exploration later. So let's start talking about the real differences in computing. We've all heard of bits and bytes and ones and zeros and the t-shirt that says there are two types of people in the world, you know, those who speak binary, yada, yada. So quantum computers use something called qubits instead of bits. And if you remember from the video where it said that there is this state where the, the cat is both at the same time, it's both alive and dead. It's, they call this superposition. And this superposition in quantum computing is the thing that really just takes it off the charts. And this is going to be a gross oversimplification, but think about what this means, right? If we have a traditional ones and zeros, then look at the, the red line here. Over time, as we increase the number of bits, right, we go up in computing power because it can be a one or a zero, but a qubit can be a one or a zero or both at the same time, which means that exponentially gets faster than something that can only be one and zero. This is one of many things that underscore the difference in power, right? So when you figure that eventually we're going to get good at quantum computing, the number of bits we have, I don't know what, I don't know the exact count these days. I probably should have looked it up, but I didn't. So take that and, and figure out what this exponent is and how much it goes up. That's how far advanced it will be. Um, I've had some deep discussions on this 
I don't remember most of it because it makes my head hurt, but they're really interesting discussions if you ever have the chance to have them. Why should you care? It's cool, right? Your video games will run faster. You're not gonna have so much lag on your, your network as you're shooting people in, in whatever game I suck at lately. So why does this matter? It matters because everything we have as a secret in a digital sense right now relies on complex math. And quantum computers are going to just crush it. Consider this. Um, actually, I'm just going to put this up and, and take a moment to just read this. So if you are not familiar with Sycamore, this is Google's quantum computer. And, and this is old news. I <laughs> think this is 2019 is when I yanked this thing. Yeah, um, 200 seconds for a, a mini junior, not, not even out of the lab quantum computer. Like this is, this is barely in, in the Petri dish. And it did in 200 seconds what the most powerful supercomputer would take 10,000 years to do. 10,000 years, 200 seconds. That's the difference. And they're not even done yet. They're not even good at it yet. So let, your, let yourself just sort of come to grips with the fact that everything we think of as a hard mathematical equation, the motion of stars, how black holes work, encryption and protection is gone. Uh, doesn't matter how many bits, doesn't matter how good it is now. That kind of processing power, if it's based on math, it's going to become obsolete. Uh, so I have, I have another short little video I wanna show you. It's actually, well, it's a longer video. I'm gonna show you the first couple of minutes, uh, but I'm gonna share the link towards the end so you can continue looking at it. This is gonna help you understand a little bit about how and why this works. And I'm sort of drawing on the, the same resource of people who can hopefully explain a little bit better than I can. And besides, it has a little guy with a lightsaber, so how can you go wrong? Or a little girl with a lightsaber. The goal of encryption is to garble data in such a way that no one who has the data can read it unless they're the intended recipient. And the encryption of pretty much all private information sent over the internet relies immensely on one numerical phenomenon. As far as we can tell, it's really, really hard to take a really big number and find its factors using a normal, non-quantum computer. Unlike multiplication, which is very fast, just multiply the digits together and add them up, finding the prime numbers that multiply together to give you an arbitrary, big, non-prime number appears to be slow. At least, the best approach we currently have that runs on a normal computer, even a very powerful one, is very slow. Like, to find the factors of this number, it took 2,000 years of computer processor time. Now, it's not yet proven that we won't eventually find a fast way to break encryption just with normal computers, but it's certain that anybody with a large working quantum computer today would pose an immediate privacy and security threat to the whole internet. And that's due to something called Shor's algorithm. Well, actually, it's due to quantum superposition and interference. They're just taken advantage of by an algorithm developed by Peter Shor, which I'm now going to attempt to explain. The kind of encryption we're talking about garbles or locks messages using a large number in such a way that decrypting or unlocking the data requires knowing the factors of that number. If somebody doesn't have the factors, either they can't decrypt the data, or they have to spend a really, really long time or a huge amount of investment in computing resources finding the factors. Our current best methods essentially just guess a number that might be a factor and check if it is. And if it isn't, you try again. And again. And again. It's slow. There are just so many numbers to check that even the fast, clever ways to make really good guesses are slow. For example, my computer took almost nine minutes to find the prime factors of this number. So if you used this number to encrypt your data, it would only be safe from me for nine minutes. If, on the other hand, you used a number like the one that took 2,000 years of computer processor time to factor, your data would definitely be safe from me and my laptop, but not from somebody with access to a server farm. This is similar to how putting a lock on your door and bars on your windows doesn't guarantee that you won't have stuff stolen from your house, but does make it take more time and more work. 
Encrypting data isn't a guarantee of protection. It's a way of making it harder to access. Hopefully enough harder that no one thinks it's worth trying. But quantum computation has the potential to make it super, super easy to access encrypted data. Like having a lightsaber you can use to cut through any lock or barrier, no matter how strong. Shor's algorithm is that lightsaber. All right, so there's another 14, 15 minutes of that. Like I said, I'll, I'll share the link. It's very cool stuff, especially if you kind of a nerd like I am. But um, the part that is important to remember is this, this change in how quickly we can determine those primes, addressing that NP hardness. Um, it's not just the future. Um, in fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come out of the share just for a second here so I can actually, I don't know, sort of look at you a little more. This is really important because it's not just what you said today. It's everything that has already been sent that somebody recorded. So give you an example. Let's say I'm an evil dictator that somehow I have access to tap into whatever. Um, military communications that they believe aren't going to be decrypted for 10,000 years, your private letter to your aunt about her inheritance, whatever it is. I'm just shoving it onto my cheap disk over here. Gobble, gobble, gobble. I can't do anything with it until I get my hands on a quantum computer. And then 50 years of encrypted data at my fingertips right now because I thought I had to store it. I've got all your secrets. I've got all the other country secrets. I've got all the corporate secrets. And I did it before quantum computers were even ready. This is why I think it is so, one of the reasons I think it's so, so important to start talking about this now because it affects our data right now. It affects our privacy right now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back to the presentation here, but I, I think this is a very critical thing to hold on to. Quantum computing is years away from being common, but that does not mean that the impact is years away from occurring. It's it's really here already. So let's uh, let's go back to this, and I and I genuinely I'm I am not a fan of fear mongering. So please please do not take this. As um, as that, oh, I lost my window. Where'd it go? Here it is. Uh, this is about being informed. Definitely about being informed, not about being afraid. Okay, are we back? Yes, yay. All right. So let's shift a little bit into the cryptography part, right? We've talked about computing. Why do we care about quantum computing? Well, we care because it's going to be super, super fast, and we care because it might break all of our encryption. Um, now let's talk about how that cryptography happens. So traditional encryption, as we mentioned, are, is based on mathematics. It's based on really difficult to solve problems. Uh, you can run into something called NP hardness, uh, if you want to look up non-deterministic polynomial time, or NP, NP hardness is is sort of the degree of difficulty in solving that problem. But quantum encryption is not that. It's not based on math. It's based on those weird theories and, and uncertainty and probability, all the stuff that physicists have been figuring out for the last hundred years about the quantum phenomena. That's what it's based on. It's not just math. So the threat we have of breaking current encryption is a little different for quantum encryption because we have to approach the problem differently. So let's try to a little illustration here, right? If you have looked into this at all, or if, if you look in the future, you're gonna run into these terms, Alice, Bob, and Eve, and all they mean are A and B and an eavesdropper, right? So two people talking and someone in the middle trying to catch it all. With quantum encryption, right, quantum cryptography, because of the nature of that, uh, by examining position, we change velocity, or by examining velocity, we change position, what we affect that, we can't determine it as well. That uh, phenomenon, or related set of phenomenon, means that if someone just views the encrypted stream, they're going to change it which is gonna be like an alarm bell ring to the people who sent and received it. They will now know 
someone tried to listen, even if they fail, right? So if you have an eavesdropper come in, whether they succeed or not, you can now take action knowing communication is compromised. I can send a message to a war-torn country and say, hey, here's the escape route I set up for you and know for certain that no one else intercepted it. It only went to the place that was really important. That's something we don't have. We do not have that level of non-repudiation or well, actually it's not really non-repudiation. Uh, we don't have that level of, of verifiability with computing right now. So this is a huge plus, right? This is for, for personal privacy. This is something we've strived for in encryption and other things that we might be able to get in a very different way. But how do we set this up, right? We still have to, we have to exchange a key or, or do something. How do, we, how do we send the message without the eavesdropper knowing the same keys that we do? And there's a very specific means of doing that called QKD, quantum key distribution. Don't worry about what these look like. I, I promise in a slide or two, this is gonna be much more clear. The thing that's important here is both Alice and Bob are going to choose, think of it as an optical filter. It's a little different, but they're gonna choose a filter. If you just think about a light on either side and they're going to decide on, is it a one or a zero? And what's the polarization basis for each slot, right? So they each have a, what is it? Eight, eight bit slot and they send it to each other. Once they get it, they overlay right, one key on top of the other key and see what matches up. And that becomes their sifted key, right? So this is the, this is the way that they, they don't even have to talk. They just they each pick one, they send it, boom, encrypted channel, done. Sounds great. Sounds utopian in terms of like cryptography and privacy. It's not that simple. It's not that easy and there are challenges, but at the same time, they have figured out a way to do this and there probably will be more coming. So let's talk about some of those limitations. Bifringence. Um, in addition to being my favorite word to use on security, questionnaires to see if someone is full of it or not. I'll put something in there like vulnerability by fringence. And if they say, yes, we have that, we address that, then I know they're lying and they didn't actually read it. But by fringence in reality is uh, one of the elements that can basically interfere with the beam. And if you interfere with the beam, it's the same thing. Somebody try to listen, it screws it up. And it's a, it's a complication of transmission. And it's not the only one. If you want to do this wirelessly, if you don't want to run special equipment all over the planet, you can only go 250 kilometers, which really is seems like a lot, but is not so much when you consider that to be satellites, at least last I checked, were 36,000 kilometers above us. So just falling a little bit short on that need there. Um, it might be better. It's been a few years since I looked that particular stat up. You also need a dedicated channel. So if you think of this in terms of physical lines, it's you can't just throw everybody onto the same one like we do now. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, you can use my wireless. Just jump on in there. Each one, need, it, because it's difficult to send this, needs a dedicated high quality channel. Right. So this is beyond fiber optics. This gets even more complicated. I'm still waiting for FiOS here, um, and believe, that's a real mountain, and I can see it from my house, even though this is a fake picture. So. We don't quite get things as quickly as you might say in Philly or other larger cities, but this is even tougher. And this is probably the one that concerns me the most. Um, clone approximation is effectively a, a way of, how do I put this? If you've ever either taken calculus or seen an asymptote on a graph, right, where you've got your, your X and Y axis, and something comes up and it just keeps getting closer and closer and closer, cut the distance by half, cut the distance by half, cut the distance by half. So you get to a point where that distance doesn't even matter anymore, right? The value is basically the same thing. That's what photon clone approximation does in this world. Uh, so in that sense, if someone can clone 
that, then the eavesdropper doesn't have to listen to your stream and tip you off. If they can create a clone split off, they can listen to this one. So there are challenges there. But if we're talking about these challenges now, we're not going to be caught unawares later, right? When's later? Uh, this graphic is from 2016 only because I can't find a good one like this more recent. Uh, but but if you look here and right, going back to, to you know, 2000, there was really one company and even for several years after that, just one or two. And then around 2011, 2012, exploded. And I suspect that if I could find one like this now, it'd probably be three, four, maybe even five times as big because you're going to see Microsoft getting involved. You're going to see Amazon getting involved. You're going to see all these people piling in. Uh, but it's still not there. Uh, at the time, I thought that 10 or more years seemed reasonable to be common um, with a probably. I still think it's 10 or more years to be common, but I don't think it's 10 or more years to be, um, shall we say, common speech, right? So you're, I think you're gonna start to see this come out more and more at, at tech conferences. You might even occasionally start to see it in a commercial here and there. Uh, within the next two to four years, I would guess, you know, this is coming into cloud now, but think about where you are and what, what you may or may not know about quantum before we started talking today. If you were at zero, well, two to four years from now, you're going to learn a lot more. But two to four years from now, everybody else that wasn't here, everyone that's never heard of it, that isn't working in technology, they're going to be at zero at that point. And trying to make this common and, and change it is still, I think, at least 10 years-ish away before it's truly uh, there. I want to come back uh, to uh, something. And right? so this is where we talked about the 200 seconds versus 10,000 years item. There's some debate on how we measure the effectiveness of a quantum computer. So I mentioned that was old news, I think that was 2019. This is a little more recent. Uh, I wanna say this one was 2020. Um, but IBM, of course, everyone wants to be dominant saying, oh, oh hey, hey, you can't beat our supercomputers. You know? Uh, but even their complaint about, well, you're not really as good as you say you are, still beats the pants off them, right? The quantum computer still knocks out in 200 seconds what IBM at their best is promising is still going to take two and a half days with special programming and extra memory and a whole bunch of other extra accommodations that are not actually used in common practice. So there's a, there's a, how oh, should I say this? There's a set of fights coming regarding quantum computing, quantum encryption, and what we do with it. And this is going to be the one that's in public. This is going to be the visible one. This is Google versus IBM versus AWS versus Azure versus whoever else jumps in the pool. The other fight is going to be the private one, the quiet one, the private investors, the government entities, the organizations with really, really really deep pockets and not a lot of oversight. Uh, that's the thing that I hope these discussions can overcome, that knowledge can overcome. If, if this research, this advancement, this approach is done in full light of public eye, open source type philosophy uh, and bringing this out truly for for the benefit of all of us, for our planet, for our people, for extending our, you know, our searches into space. We want that to happen out in the open. We don't want that to quietly occur behind the scenes, have someone crack all the cryptography and keep everyone else from ever getting it. So I, I hope I didn't harp on this too much. I bring it up because it's gonna be really easy to get sidetracked 
and lost in the public fight and lose track of what might happen over here. Fortunately, the easiest thing you can do is start learning about it, start coding it. As soon as that thing comes available on the cloud platform you like, jump on it, learn a little bit. Maybe you love it, maybe you hate it, maybe you tell your friend. All of that takes power away from those shady secret areas. All right, so let's, let's get down to the real thing here. Nobody knows. Not me, none of the experts. Nobody knows if this is a thing tomorrow or in 10 years, or if it already happened 10 years ago. Uh, the best we can do is keep on plotting forward with the information we've got. Here's the information I would like for you to take away here. This is a paradigm shift. This is a big deal. This is not, oh, hey, look, we, we have a new network intrusion detection system. Oh, hey, we invented a new language called Java that runs everywhere. No, this is like, PC coming to the home instead of a, a computer taking up a whole room, changing big. Uh, this is a huge deal. Now there's good news that comes with this. It's not all bad. We could have near perfect confidentiality. And we talked about the ability to know if our communication was intercepted. I think personally, that's huge. We have the chance to rebuild the internet, a quantum internet. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with this, but the internet was developed not to be secure, but literally to be insecure. When, when it was coming out in, in DARPA and, and all that, the entire purpose was thought with, oh, well, so what if another academic wants to get into my computer and see my stuff? Of course, I want to share that information. And we all know well, what that's turned into. So now we have the chance to build it again. If our whole computing system knowledge networks is going to be overturned that means we get to recreate the rules that's really good news of course there's bad news what about all of the data that is already possibly being stored and kept to decrypt later um, that's something that i don't certainly don't have a good solution to other than be careful where you send and where you put it um, you know some things are unavoidable you can't ask your bank to stop keeping the stuff there. You can't ask your government to change their secret procedures, but you can know and you can decide what you do with your own stuff, your own organizations. If you want to look a little more into it, this is the video that we stopped short. I think it's about 17 minutes long. I've watched it a few times. I pick up something new every time. I definitely forget most of it as soon as the video stops each time. So uh, it's, it's sometimes tough to, to hold it all, it's okay. A couple of articles, papers I've come across that I found particularly useful. Um, this last one here I, gets me excited, not because of so much the content, but the fact that quantum computing hit the Harvard Business Review. That's a milestone, that's some kind of marker. I'm not sure exactly what it means, but that means something about coming out more into the public view, becoming more visible in business. Some questions I invite you to consider. Um, what are other ways that, that I haven't mentioned that, that this could impact technology or, or security? Um, what's different in programming for quantum computer is different from traditional. It is different, but that's something that it definitely is going to take some time to, to get familiar with. How can you get involved? Um, a lot of research institutions, academic areas are very interested in this and so are the vendors. They want partnerships, they want volunteers, they want people interested. Sometimes it's selfish, they wanna promote their tech, but they still need someone to do it, someone to learn. So there's a lot of opportunity to get involved with those things out there. You don't have to change careers. Um, and that brings me to the end of, of what I've prepared here. So I'm going to take this down and see where we're at. I'd be happy to discuss and admit that I don't know a lot of things. Thanks, Josh. I will relay some questions to you from chat. Um, thank you for uh, putting the fear of quantum in us. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's a lot of fun stuff. 
Okay, I'm going to read the questions that are in chat. If you have more questions, please put them in chat. Um, I'm going to call the name of the person who asked. I'll give you a brief moment if you want to unmute and ask, otherwise I will ask. All right, um, starting with, and apologies for pronunciations, uh, Letitia, um, did you want to jump on? I'll give you a second. Hey, thank you, Josh, uh, for your presentation. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, so it's Leticia, it means join Latin, but that's okay. I have a strong French accent and I guess you do understand me anyway. Um, I have a silly question, I think. I am confused between quantum co computing and GPT-3, uh, which has seen a lot of breakthrough uh, recently. GPT-3, uh, if I'm familiar with that, I'm drawing a blank on it. Um, um, it's about you know, like how your, your um, model in machine learning runs faster thanks to better chips from what I understood. Uh, so I, I have to just admit ignorance here. If, if I did anything, I would be purely shooting in the dark. But I, I can tell you this, as soon as we hang up off of this call, I'm going to be reading about GPT-3 because it looks interesting, but I'm not familiar with it. So I can't make that contrast. I'm sorry. OK, no worries. Thank, thank you so much for the presentation. It was great. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the question. And thank you, Josh. Uh, next question is from Pam. Pam, did you want to ask or do you want me to ask? Oh, yeah, I'll go ahead and ask. Um, I think you kind of broached on that, but I'm really like I have concerns around who owns the power of quantum computing and who will like, is there concerns around like if there's regulations, uh, responsible regulations and ethical regulations and guidelines, is someone taking a look at this because whoever owns the power, you know, owns the, I guess the world I keep thinking about. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, there is no, I don't know, central body that's been established to address it. There definitely should be, and I'd even go so far as to say it probably should go hand in hand with, with anyone that's defining ethics for artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because it's, that's just a matter of time too. When, when AI is a person, we've been predicting it for as long, at least since iRobot you know, the book and quantum computing is, is such a jump that that might be the spark. So I, I think that's, a, it's critical and I don't know of anyone doing it. And if no one's doing it, that might be a phenomenal thing to, to start uh, grassroots, you know, an organic, hey, you know what? Let's just start coming up with, uh, what was the, the Asmos thing? The three laws of robotics. Well, maybe we have the, the three guidelines of quantum. I, that's a great idea. I, I hadn't really thought about to, about it that way, but it's important. Oh, abs I think so, absolutely. That, and that was really my question. I might have more later though. Fire away. Thanks, Josh and Pam. Uh, at this point, there are no more questions in Zoom chat, but I do have a list of my own questions. So if people want to reflect a bit and uh, ask questions, I'll buy you some time. Uh, so the first question is, how can I use quantum computing to get rich mining Bitcoin? Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't think you can, because if I remember correctly, um, Bitcoin is based on making the math harder. Um, it's self-adaptive, right? So you'd still have to draw a certain amount of electricity can do it. And if, if a surge in capacity was detected, it would compensate somehow. And I'm, this is a blockchain thing I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stumble on, but I don't think you can do it because I think that Bitcoin was actually made to prevent something like that. Maybe not thinking about quantum computing, but definitely thinking about differences in computing power. I wish we could, because then we could all get rich and spend the rest of our lives traveling the world warning people about quantum computing. Thank you. Um, next question I have. <clears throat> so this, I'm not a physics expert. Um, 
with quantum entanglement, you have these coupled photons, right? So what is it, why do you need to transmit anything if your entangled photons will change state with each other without moving? Great question. Uh, maybe we don't. I. It's only relatively recently, at least that I've read, that they were even really able to prove the entanglement over some, any type of physical distance, right? It's always been theoretical. And I, I can't even remember the distance it was. I can't remember if it was across the room or across the hall or across the planet. It was something that they did, they published recently where they demonstrated that changing it in one affected the other. So we're just not good at it enough yet, but that actually might be the answer. We might not need it in anything. Uh, and if you really want to get crazy and, and, and I don't want to say conspiratorial because it's now coming as factual news, this information coming from the U.S. government about UFO reports and acknowledgement that there's something that moves really fast through air, through space, through water, through whatever, could use something like that. I, I mean, it, it could literally be that. Uh, so for all we know, you literally just set the tone and solve the problem. We just have to figure out the math. That would certainly make it easier to replicate data if you don't actually have to replicate oh, it. Yeah, instantly, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Meg, the floor is yours. Hi. Um, Hello. I had um, two questions. One was who do you think is going to kind of break into the quantum field first, black hat or white hat? I think that's almost like Schrodinger's cat, right? It's almost 50-50. Um, I hate to say it, but I think if we left the world to its own devices, it would be black hat because the motivations of greed and control and power tend to move along faster and with less regard for the destruction than the motivations of altruism and making the world a better place. But that's also one of the reasons that I give this talk at all, because I don't want to see that happen. Because the more of us who know about this, the more of us who talk about this, the more attention it gets for research dollars, the more people get involved and the better chance we have of beating the black hats to that. But you know, well, I guess, guess we'll have to wait and see, you know, for the actual answer. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, I don't like it. Yeah. Um, I agree. Also, um, Alicia brought up the quantum entanglement. Is that in the same, like, wheelhouse as dark matter? I don't know if I've ever heard those two connected, but that's a really interesting theory. Um, what we know about dark matter is basically nothing um, I, other than we know we don't know a lot of stuff. Yeah. I, you know, I'm gonna have to give that one some thought because it's, 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 it certainly could be. Um, you know, we're learning new things about dark matter all the time, and the idea of entanglement would lend itself well, even if something was literally on the other side of the universe, right? They're still connected. The time, space shouldn't matter. Um, that might be a huge component. That's a great avenue of research, I would think. I mean, all of my knowledge is purely based on science fiction novels, so... Great place to start. Yeah, it's like other people's theorized thoughts come to life, but. No, but, but I, I think actually it's not a strong thing. I, I mean, uh, put it this way. I mean, you did quote Almost, Asimov earlier, so. Oh yeah, As, I, I, I am a big fan. And I initially was pursuing a physics degree. And then I learned that I would rather stab myself in the eye with a fork and actually practice physics all day, every day and research it. What I did love was the ideas, the big things. Like, oh, well, what happens if you go into a black hole? Well, how do we travel through time? I, 
I'm not the guy that the person that's going to go and figure that out and do the math, but I love thinking about the possibilities and, and you know, ideas like yours of, well, hey, well, maybe quantum entanglement does have something to do with dark matter. That's not going to come from the person head down, scratching out numbers. They're not up here thinking about this, this larger thing. They're down here focused on this micro thing. So, but you need both of those to solve the problem. I, I think science fiction is a, a wonderful place for, for those kind of ideas and, and coming up with stuff that we don't have yet. Cool, cool. Thanks, Meg. Uh, and thank you for your answers, Josh. Uh, we do have uh, another question from Joanne. Uh, if you'd like to ask it, feel free to unmute or I can ask for you. I've got my kids coming in and out. So if you could, please. Yeah, sure, no problem. Will quantum computing be able to reduce the delay in communication between here and Mars and make it possible for real-time communication? I don't think so, simply because um, the transmission is, isn't something that the computing can help with, right? That's, that's a little, unless we get into the entanglement thing, which really gets into a different aspect of, of quantum mechanics, quantum physics, it could in theory do a significant compression, right? Allowing you to do maybe like a one second burst and, and send all of human history across in one shot, something like that. But I don't think it would necessarily change the, the speed of transmission. Again, with a caveat that if we, un, if we sort out this whole entanglement thing where you change, change an electron or you know, a particle over here and it affects a particle over there, then all bets are off. That, that changes everything. But what I know of it today, no, I don't think it could have that impact. But it would be cool if it did. Thank you. Okay, uh, more of my questions. So you did talk about how this will potentially change current programming languages, more of a question to us. So maybe you can answer, have you been writing uh, software for quantum computers and what language do you use for that? I have not been able to get access to a quantum computer. So it is absolutely on my list of things I want to do. And I've been kind of waiting for it to be a little more available. In, in cloud services like AWS and Azure to start working with it. Um, I can't remember, there, there is a, a particular language that's kind of emerging for it, but I can't remember the name of it. Um, I'll dig up what I can and, and share that out afterwards, but now I'm, I'm waiting to do it. And if someone finds a, a viable path in there that does not require me working as some kind of research faculty member, uh, then I'm absolutely interested. Uh, Rachel in chat is, is mentioning that IBM uh, does have a program with pre quantum compute time. Um, see, I didn't even know that. That's awesome. I know On the topic tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On the topic of programming, maybe this is an oversimplification. Would we have to change some of our understanding of data types from binary to ternary in order to adapt to the three different states? I think it would depend on the level of programming you're doing, right? So if you're, if you're in a high level language, um, I don't, yeah, you know what? Sorry, my brain's trying to, to connect, cr uh, create multi-dimensional structures in my head and figure out what that means. I think you very well might, but I think it would be a lot like IPv6. Right? So we've been taught here about IPv6 for what well, it feels like forever. And even the places that do have it, they don't really have it. They just sort of put an IPv6 gateway in the front that translates everything behind it. I suspect that if and as new data structures become available, there'll be some type of interface that you can use so that we can still think about structures the way we used to as we get used to this new thing. Um, but hey, the more I think about it, I bet there is. I bet there will be some, some new way of storing, archiving, processing that, that'll change the way we think of those classic you know, lists, arrays, dictionaries, whatever you happen to be working with. Uh, I'm thinking really more cool. of like 
ternary ternary bits instead of binary bits, right? Yeah, yeah. Would that is I that a oversimplification? It is a little bit because it's it's not really a third bit; it's both at the same time. And th and this is one of the, I'll, I'll be honest, one of the reasons that when I have considered programming for for quantum computing, it intimidates me a little bit because you really do need to understand a little bit better what's happening to make full use of it, right? And it's as much as I use that graph of, well, it's it's one and zero versus one zero or both, it is more complicated than just three, but I am not qualified enough to tell you exactly how. Okay, I'm gonna go a little further out here and probably gonna be outside of this topic a little bit. Uh, so if you think about functional programming style, you have these monads like optional and an optional could be there or not there and you don't know until you resolve it is that sort of conceptually does that sound like a quantum bit and quack like a quantum bit <laughs> it does a little bit but you would have to actually act on never knowing you wouldn't necessarily resolve it okay you would calculate the probabilities that of, of it resolving a given way and then build around those probabilities because in quantum like if you think about the the cat thing they didn't talk about opening the box in, in that video and actually seeing so much just once they talked about well if we did it a thousand times a million times what are what are those probabilities come out to so you're really constructing around the fact that you never resolve it you said Alicia, you said monad in your example? Yes, it's a functional programming concept. And it takes a while to wrap your head around. But sorry about the deviation. Uh, the most common monad is a maybe monad. So if you're familiar with Java, it's an optional. And you might call a database and it returns a maybe. I might have had a record like this, but maybe I didn't. Uh, and there's these con constructs called okay. monads. That yeah so Maybe. then yep exactly and so each language has its own representation but uh functional programming really delves into it um if you've done reactive programming single might be familiar to you as well it's a different topic though okay i can tell i'm speaking with people who are far better programmers than i am Maybe, maybe you are, maybe you're not. We're talking about monad. <laughs> all right, I think that's all we've got in chat. And uh, I've run out of questions and started deviating into other topics, so I'm good. Um, so uh, Becca or Pam, did you wanna wrap up? I'll let Pam. I saw the eyebrow up thing and I thought that was class, but I wasn't really sure. So I just want to say thank you so much, Josh. I thought that was so interesting. Um, I actually sent a message to uh, Becca and let her know that I don't think I'll be able to sleep tonight. So uh, thank you for this nighttime horse, like this thought process, but we really want to thank you on behalf of um, women who code in this group. Thank you for being a phenomenal ally today for us. And uh, we hope to actually have you back. Uh, I mean, I do. So. I am I'm super honored to be here. It's, this is something I'm passionate about. And I like, I like to share the information. I like questions I can't answer. Because that makes me think I go back, you know, I'm telling you, I did not forget about GPT-3. Um, <laughs> that's, that's on the list. You know, the stuff about entanglements on the list. So uh, I love doing this and uh, it just, it makes me happy knowing that we can get these conversations going because much like with open source, you know, the power really is there when, when people have it and it's not hidden in a dark corner somewhere. So um, that's fantastic. I'm so happy this group is here. It's so cool to see everything that you're doing and that's just, thank you for having me. Great. And we'll get, uh, we'll wrap up and then um, get, sorry about that. Bingo. My dog just called bingo. Um, <laughs> We'll uh, get the slides out and uh, Alicia just put this, she'll have the links and stuff into in Meetup. So thanks again so 